So, yeah, I mean, sure, it would make sense if uh, the person who was translating it needed a word that sounded like Earth and they just chose globe. But that doesn't say anything about the, the authenticity uh, of the Bible itself. And there were people that predated the, the writing, uh, the authorship of the Bible, who knew that the world was round. Oh, yeah, Aristoth Aristosthenes. Aristosthenes figured yeah. this out. And it doesn't really prove anything, the fact that the Bible got it wrong in another place. I mean, again, that's the same sort of thing you get with, with uh, again, like the Spider-Man example, is you have a character or a book that's written by multiple authors, you're going to get, inevitably, contradictions. Right. So, Spe I'd, Speaking of contradictions, we'll talk more about those later oh, also. Certainly. Uh, you want to go for another one? Do we want to go for an, another email? Actually, let's break into news. Let's go we? into the news really quick. Yeah. Um, this is something, this actually comes from Newsweek. Uh, Warrior Imam, the Kremlin's poster boy for moderate Islam, may be radicalizing the region. Now, um, the video shows a gun barrel jutting from the rear window of a shiny black Lada sedan as it cruises down uh, Putin Prospect, the new boulevard of designer shops in the Chechen capital, Grozny. Spotting a pair of young women in long skirts but without headscarves, the vehicle's occupants open fire. The two pedestrians scream. They don't fall. A blot of red paintball ink is spreading across one young woman's blouse. As the vehicle pulls away, the camera shows two women dashing for safety into the nearest shop. Um, Chechnya's enforcers of the supposed Islamic propriety have struck again. In the name of combating terrorism, President Ramzan Kadyrov has declared war on what he regards as public indecency. My dream is for all women to wear headscarves in accordance with Islamic law, he told Newsweek recently, to assist in the fight against uh, fight and correctly supposed uh, correct supposed un-Islamic conduct, he established his own Taliban-style morality police, the Center for Spiritual and Moral Development and Education. The region has resisted Moscow's control uh, for centuries, but in the past decade or so, violence has spread and intensified as Islamist extremism has flourished everywhere elsewhere in the world. This year, suicide bombers killed more than 40 people in the Mo Moscow subway and more than uh, 150 in a series of attacks in uh, North Caucasus. Um, basically, he, we're talking about somebody here who believes that their religion gives them the right to um, attack other people. And he tries to deny that any sort of um, people working for him are the ones shooting paintballs at women who show skin or not wearing a headscarf in accordance with their religious laws. However, he doesn't denounce it either. And uh, clearly, I think he's also helped creating an environment where this sort of stuff can spread. I mean, he's right. actually assaulting people with a paintball gun, these people, um, because they won't follow their religious laws. I mean, this is just insane. Right, I mean, and, and I, the, it doesn't, I don't, I, the part of the article I didn't catch, if it's necessarily going to be escalating, but you would imagine that when you create a tolerant atmosphere of, of a sort of more moderate type of abuse, that then you would expect it to start to escalate. Because yeah. it often does. I mean, when you allow bullying to happen, uh, it, it will only get serious and more widespread. If you tolerate if you tolerate assault on people, it will only get worse. I, I just think it's worth mentioning that this guy is held up, at least by Putin and, and Medvedev, as being sort of this, um, this pillar of what he considers moderate Islam. I think we need to talk about why is the bar for what's considered moderate Islam so low that... Uh, I mean, yes, he's not, these people aren't strapping bombs themselves and blowing up people in a marketplace, and they're not beheading people, screaming, Allahu Akbar. However, uh, where in the United States, let's just look, take this, this same thing, and this is what we talked about last week, is applying terminology equally to, to multiple things. If we're going to use the word moderate for somebody who feels the need to sort of force these laws on people, would we consider a moderate Christian uh, somebody like, say, Pat Robertson? Uh, this is worse than Pat Robertson, because even Pat Robertson isn't sending young people out into the streets to uh, harass uh, women who aren't obeying their religious laws, mm. or let alone shoot them with a paintball gun. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't know. My, I mean, my, I'm totally exasperated by the fact that this exists and that people seem, seem to view this as a triumph, sort of, of a triumph of this restraint. I just, uh, I, I don't know. I don't think that public humiliation is necessarily the... Uh, uh, a signpost of a, of a society getting more tolerant. I think that means that it's, I mean, certainly if this is replacing murdering people in the streets for doing that, I would suppose on the short term it's better. But I don't, but I don't think the public humiliation is, is, like I said, the cornerstone of a society getting better, getting more mature and uh, less likely to, to tolerate uh, assault and violence. Well, I wouldn't necessarily, citizens. I wouldn't necessarily call it 
better, I just call it less bad. Because yeah. I would never call shooting, you know, assaulting somebody with a paintball gun versus assaulting them with, you know, a pistol that actually fires real bullets, lethal weapon. Um, that's not better, that's just less bad. The same way that me uh, stabbing somebody on the street is less, uh, it would, you know, that, that's bad. But it, it wouldn't be, it would just be less bad for me just to beat the crap out of somebody unprovoked. Right. I wouldn't say, oh, well, we're making great strides, <laughs> we're no longer stabbing people anymore. Right. Yeah, I, uh, Chechnya has its, certainly has its problems, uh, for sure. And I just, I think what we're seeing is regression, not progression. I don't, yeah. I, I think this is just a veneer. Yeah, it says, uh, Kadvarov, um, vigorously promotes his brand of Islam is what he calls the, to what he calls the evil so-called denomination Wahhabism. He's lobbying the Kremlin to place all Russian muftis under the supervisor of Chechen imams who would draft sermon covering religious and political issues to be taught to all Russian mosques. So basically we're talking about complete breakdown of church and state. Right. That we're telling government employees straight out this, these are the political and religious views that you must take. And to violently, you know, enforce those on other people whether they hold your religious beliefs or not. So, yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> uh, what have you got? Uh, oh, yes. Well, we get, we're, we'll pick on Islam a little bit more. So the, uh, this is from CNN. The headline is, Court in United Arab Emirates says, beating wife, child, okay, if no marks are left. And I think we've heard stories about this before. Yeah. A court in the United Arab Emirates says a man is permitted under Islamic law to physically discipline his wife and children as long as he leaves no marks and has tried other methods of punishment, the country's top court ruled. The ruling came in a case of a man who slapped his wife and slapped and kicked his 23-year-old daughter. The court ruled that a man has the right to punish his wife and children. This includes beating them after he has tried other options, such as admonition and then abstaining from sleeping with his wife, which I, is I not, think it's hilarious. It's not much of a punishment. You're, punish, you're punishing your wife by with withholding sex from her. Right. Well, I don't. I mean, uh, where, what, where does anyone think that would work? I think the. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, really. I think within Islamic patriarchy societies, I think that they actually think that that's some sort of punishment, but in reality, it's not really no. a punishment. Um, yeah, it goes so on to say that several experts. Uh, in Islamic law, say that it's uh, against the law to permit wife beating. However, this expert, uh, was it Hashim Brown, said he feels confident that the UAA didn't, court didn't sanction injury abuse. He said that Sharia law is complex and is open to inter inter interpretation. So, does that mean it's. The, that, that's the part that's the most difficult for me to get about, especially when you're taking uh, religious doctrine and inscribing it into actual law. Is it. Always permitted, or is it permitted or not permitted? Which one is, is it, it open to interpretation, or is it not? Because right. it's not like I can I can be brought before a Sharia court and go, oh well, I just just use the reason it another way, so you can't enforce that. Either it's enforceable law, right. or it's not. But the minute you actually have official courts that can jail or kill or beat you, that's the point where it, no, it isn't open to interpretation anymore. Well, I mean, even within this story, you've seen the the distinction between. The judges themselves who are attempting to uh, who are attempting to basically so this guy got in trouble because he took it a little bit too far. Essentially, it was it was he he got punished. He got some sort of slap on the wrist because he beat them a little bit too much. But it's okay to beat them. And then another uh, another Islamic scholar says it's argued that in Islamic law it is quote absolutely unlawful to abuse a wife, injure her, or insult her dignity. So. Oh yeah, because apparently you know is honor killings and forcing you know forcing her to wear a cloth bag with an ice in it that isn't an attack on her dignity. Anymore. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, this ends up being my problem entirely with fundamentalism and um, uh, societies that consider religious doctrine to be totally inerrant, which is um, you uh, you either have to say that it's true and follow it by the letter, or you have to have a, a way in which it can be interpreted that uh, a way in which it can be interpreted that um, allows for, I don't know, that, I mean, that allows for interpretation. It's, it's either 100% it's either static or it's not. It can't be, it can't be both. Yeah, that's, that's the weird thing with religion is because you can't prove any of this stuff. Right. It just comes down to everyone's separate interpretation and they're like, oh, well, that's clearly wrong because they're just applying their own sense of morality on it. It's, it's just nonsense. That's just simply why religion shouldn't have any sort of government power to punish, jail, or kill anyone. Right. Period. Speaking of punishing or jailing anyone, uh, if you want to call us and, and uh, chide us for speaking ill of, of religion, 206-421-5658. We want to hear what you have to say about it. Definitely. Or if you just want to register your, in, your indignance. 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 Indignation. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, we just have one last news story. This is, this is something that actually comes a little bit closer to home than the United Arab Emirates. Uh, <laughs> this one is actually comes from Patterson, California. This uh, was put up by Hemet Mehta on his blog, The Friendly Atheist. Uh, Atheist City Council candidate is subject of attempted smear campaign. James Leonard is running for city council campaign in, in uh, Patterson, California, a city of just over 20,000 uh, people. It's a local race. You wouldn't think that the vitriol would get that hard. But the opposition heard that Leonard was an atheist, and they sent out this mailer. If you can bring up that magic image. Um, it comes under the uh, headline, Character Matters. <laughs> and as you can see there, they've got background information on the scary godless heathen in there. Right, things. I love how, it's just how they point to his status on Facebook. His status on Facebook. <laughs> oh, and it says, oh my uh, God, Facebook. they've got definitions. I don't know why they have anti-theism right next to it in uh, parentheses, as, as if it needs to be explained. That, anti-theism. Yeah, yes. it's... Uh, so yes, a person who shows there is no God. Yeah, and then they say uh, they mention that he's uh, he includes two of his favorite books on there, which is you know God is not great by uh, Christopher Hitchens and the God Delusion by Christopher Do uh, Richard Dawkins. It says, uh, do the citizens of Patterson really want an atheist, anti-theist representing our community by voting for James Le Leonard? You're uh, seeing you're voting for a person who, as an anti-theist atheist. Uh, not only does not believe in God, and I love that that underline. Bring that image up again, because yeah. it's so beautiful. You does can, not does not believe in God, <laughs> underlined there. But he's a, he's opposed to the belief in the evidence of a God. Uh, well, no, I'm sure he'd be happy if there actually was some evidence. A belief in God is what our nation and community is based on. No, no it's not. It's really, really not. Our community and our country are based on the idea of secularism, the idea that the government doesn't have the right to enforce its belief or in, um, it doesn't have the right to a belief. The government right. does not have a freedom of religion. Individual people have a freedom of religion and expression. The government is an artificial entity that's here to represent all of us. And the way it does that effectively, and this is written right into the Constitution, by not respecting or prohibiting expressions of religion. That means you don't take sides on things, you don't take opposition to things, period, including our side. So I think that it's amazing how many religious people don't seem to get this. We did have a Christian a few weeks ago who did get this, and we just beg those people. So right. if you're a theist out there who does understand the value of the separation of church and state, you really got to talk to your other theists. It yeah. can't just be us. It can't just be us talking about this, because it protects everybody, yeah. period. Um, and it's a I, I'll just say as a personal note, it would be great if we had a time of in the political environment where it would be okay for you to be an atheist and how it wouldn't necessarily be a strike against you and or disqualify you outright, which for most races of, of import, it disqualifies you I, outright. I actually would like to get to the point. It's like, I don't want to get to the point where this becomes like an atheist country with atheist laws. I don't want, I don't want any of that. I, mm. I certainly wouldn't vote for somebody simply because they were an atheist. Yeah. Um, what I would like to get is to the point where, say, the UK is in their last um, election that they have, the last general election, the candidate of the Liberal Democrats Party, um, Nick Clegg, is an atheist. And his atheism was a total non-issue in the campaign. Nobody cared about it. That's what I'd like to get to. I'd like to get to the point where it just becomes a non-issue. That unless your beliefs are pushing you to do something really stupid like deny scientific evidence, for, say, evolution or the age of the world or something like that, or, oh, I don't believe in global warming because God said he wouldn't drown the planet again. That's basically a quote from a congressman. That's the sort of stuff that does affect your policy, but simply lack of belief in a God or belief in a God, I really don't care, um, provided that you're not trying to push that on other people. Right. Period. It says uh, it's, th this was an attempt to make Leonard look bad, but it doesn't really work when he admits to the charge without a blink, right? Other candidates might try to fight it when opponents call them an atheist, but Leonard proudly admits it is true. He's an atheist, and there's nothing wrong with that.